for that Christian that is saying, oh, there's no intercourse, I find that a lot of them are still smooshing, a lot of them are still kissing, a lot of them are fondling. In fact, when you see Christians that are even trying to use their energy to be celibate, they are the ones that are very judgmental to other Christians because they are suffering so much, it pains them when they see another person escaping with what they are suffering from. They say, how dare you? They want to kill other Christians that make mistakes because they are suffering, they are not even happy. Hey, hi there, welcome to our YouTube channel. My name is Dr. Kingsley Okwonkwo. It's good to be here again. If you are just stumbling on this channel for the first time or you're a regular viewer that have not yet subscribed, please make sure you subscribe right now. All right, just click the subscribe button, like, share, do all the other things you need to do. Um, I want to appreciate all those that are regular viewers here. Good to see you guys again. Um, don't also forget that we have a lot of sister channels that could be a blessing to you. We have the Q&A channel. So in that, on that channel, we just do Q&A. Q&A with PK and PM. Uh, that's me and my wife. Then we have the LDM with PK channel. So that's our official ministry channel. Also has a lot of um, useful content that can be a blessing. Then we have Wholesome Sexuality. So that's a channel totally dedicated to sex. It's being handled by a trained Christian sexologist. All right. So loads of stuff. Then, of course, my wife's channel, Pastor Mildred Kingsley Okonkwo. So loads of helpful stuff. So make sure you like, subscribe, and do all those things. Today, we have a very interesting topic. It's one that I'm really passionate about, um, that I feel maybe in this day and age, not enough people are talking about it. When, when we were younger, we had more conversations about it, but it seems as time is going, um, somehow we just skip that conversation these days. And today, I'm talking about celibacy and sexual purity. Celibacy versus sexual purity. You know, I wanted to also title this, um, I don't believe in celibacy. <laughs> I don't believe in celibacy. It has no scriptural backing. It's not supported by God and stuff like that. But hey, basically, you can title it. We'll, we'll, we'll decide that later. But the important thing is that um, we just want to look at, you know, celibacy, you know, versus sexual purity. Um, for some time now, that word celibacy has become a bit common amongst Christians. And I've, I've uh, you know, it always troubles me because it is not a Christian word. In fact, Christians um, really don't, uh, Christians are not called to celibacy. Let me say it that way. Christians are not called to celibacy. It's not, I mean, there's no such scriptural instruction, no such scriptural backing, no scriptural suggestion that we are called to celibacy. So let me say it clearly again. Christians are not called to celibacy. So I don't like when I hear Christians say that, that I'm, I'm being celibate. For me, it just rubs me wrong. It just speaks of someone that doesn't understand the depth of what you know we are called into as Christians. As Christians, we're not called into celibacy. We're called to sexual purity. And there is a world of difference. The moment as a Christian you are focused on celibacy, you have most likely missed, you know, the mark already. We're not called to celibacy as Christians at all. No such instruction. What we are called to is sexual purity, and they are very different, which is what we're going to look at today. I'm going to show you at least seven differences between celibacy and sexual purity. But before I start, um, I would like to read a few scriptures, okay? As a believer, as a child of God, you must submit yourself to scripture. We don't, we don't have opinions. We don't, we don't teach or live by opinions. We don't teach or live by trends because trends will always change. Opinions will always differ from person to person. But the word of God is our final authority and that never changes. The same, 100 years from now, the standards of God are still the same. So as a believer, um, I expect you, if you're a born again Christian, a Christian that has fully dedicated to the Lord, you, your standard and the final authority in your life is the Word of God, not what a popular talk show host is saying, not what a popular podcaster is saying, not what a popular blogger is saying. It is what the Bible is saying. Very important. So we have to go to the Scripture. What does the Bible say about celibacy or about sexual purity? Let me, let me even, let, let's even define celibacy. What is celibacy? Celibacy is simply, you know, abstinence from sexual intercourse in simple terms, okay? is abstinence from sexual intercourse. So let's read scripture. Let me show you 
um, a few scriptures. I, 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 I'm supposed to read at least three scriptures, um, you know, to buttress this point. All right, so we're going to read First Thessalonians chapter 4, from verse 1, I think, all the way to verse 8. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, he said, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. He said, For you know what commandments we give you by the Lord Jesus Christ. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So this is important. You know, that's a word that is not common anymore. <laughs> sanctification. He said that you should abstain from fornication. Very important. Do you see this? He said, For this is the will of God. That means God's will. God's desire, God's plan, God's best, God's commandment for you as a believer is your sanctification. That you should abstain from fornication. Now, please take note of that word fornication. All right? This word fornication does not mean sexual intercourse. Now, it involves sexual intercourse, but it's not sexual intercourse. In fact, the Greek word is pornea. Um, it's from the word where they got pornography. Basically, what this word is trying to say is any form of sexual perverseness, uncleanliness, or immorality. Take note. Every form of sexual perverseness, uncleanliness, and immorality. So it's a wide, broad um, word. It has, it, it, it's not speaking specifically about intercourse. This is important. This is important, guys. In fact, some people have even used this, the fact that there is actually no word, uh, or most times in New Testament when fornication was used, that it wasn't referring to sex to mean that we can have premarital sex. Many people have used that. But that's not what he's saying. The word is not weaker than intercourse. It's actually bigger or broader than intercourse. I don't know if you get this. That word pornea, used, translated fornication here, is not a weaker word than sexual intercourse. It's actually a broader word. So sexual intercourse is part of it, but it's just a small fraction of it. Because there are a whole lot of other things that can be ranked or rated or described as sexual perverseness, as sexual uncleanliness, and sexual immorality. Okay, so let's go back. It said, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. God wants your holiness your wholesomeness sexually. That's what sanctification is talking about. Your, your purity, your wholesomeness, sexually speaking. He said that you should abstain from fornication. That every one of you, verse 4, should know how to possess his vessel, that's his body, in sanctification and honor. So these are all key words. In sanctification and in honor. See that word sanctification again. He said... Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. This is so good. Listen, this video, you know, there are a lot of my videos that even an unbeliever can relate to it. But this particular video is specially designed for people that are believers in Christ. If you're not a believer in Christ, you know, I'm, we're not even in a discussion right now. What you need is to accept Jesus. What you need is to know the Savior. But I'm speaking specifically to people that are born again and are still Living like they are Gentiles, just like the scripture says. Who is Gentiles? Somebody that doesn't know Christ. All right? They are still living like people that are not under the law or under the commandment of God, under the, the wisdom of God. They are living like people like, not like that. Look at it. He says, don't, don't be like that even as the Gentiles which know not God. He said that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God had not called us, see it again, verse 7, for God had not called us unto uncleanliness, same thing, but unto holiness. They are just repeating the same thing over and over again. See verse 8, he therefore that despised, despised not man, but God. Do you see this? The person that despised what we're saying now is not despising man, but God who had also given unto us his Holy Spirit. This is important. 
who has given us his Holy Spirit. Hmm. There's so much. And a lot of the points we are going to um, draw are from this scripture. So I need you to note them. Things like honor. Things like whoever despises is not, despise, is not despising man but God. And that God has given unto us his Holy Spirit. All those things are important to the points we are going to make today. All right? Very, very important. So let's read one more scripture. Uh, we have one or two more I want us to read. But let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. All right? Uh, just the next chapter. Verse 22 and 23. All right? 1 Thessalonians 5. 22 and 23. Okay, let me even start from verse 21. It says, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. 22 says, abstain from all appearance of evil. So as believers, we are not only abstaining from evil, but even the things that appear, the things that, are, that, that, that look untidy, look unholy, look difficult to explain, you know, they say, I, 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 I flee from every appearance of, of uncleanliness. So because believers ask me all the time, can I spend this, the, the night in my boyfriend's house, in my girlfriend's house? It's an appearance of evil. It's going to be difficult to tell anybody that something they have to say, we're praying all night. It's untidy. It's an appearance of evil. All right? It says, um, abstain from all appearance of evil. 23 says, and the very God of peace sanctify you holy. See it again. Sanctify you holy. And I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. Very important. Be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? This is, this is very, very important. Last scripture we'll read. Because all these are important. I'm reading all the scriptures. Then we'll go into the... The explanation. First Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians 6. Okay, no, what no, I'll read this, I'll read that at the end. Okay, so let's let's get into it. So sexual um, celibacy is basically abstaining from um, you know sexual intercourse, but sexual purity is talking about you being wholesome sexually, it's talking about you staying sanctified and cleaned. Sexually, so they are they are they are actually two different things. They are not they are not in any way related. They are not in any way you know connected. As a child of God, we are God like scriptures read. We are not called to celibacy. We are called to sexual purity, which is talking about the sanctification of your spirit, soul, and your body. It's talking about total you know sanctification, total you know wholesomeness total purity. That's what it's talking about. That's what a believer is called to do. A believer is not called to celibacy. So what are some of the differences? Because when Christians or when people say they are being celibate, a lot of times, a lot of times, they are focused on not indulging in intercourse, but they are usually involved with outercourse. <laughs> Did you get that? A lot of times when believers are saying, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being celibate. I'm called to celibacy. A lot of times, I know it's not every time, but a lot of times, they are focused so much on not being a part of intercourse, but they are very involved with outercourse because they are not looking at it the way God is looking at it. So celibacy is not a Christian word. It's not really for Christians. What we are called to is way higher than that. So let me give you about seven differences between celibacy, you know, and um, uh, sexual purity, between celibacy and sexual purity. Because for that Christian that is saying, oh, there's no intercourse, you can find that a lot of them are still smooshing, a lot of them are still kissing, a lot of them are fondling, they are petting, they are doing all kinds of things. And you know, it's not even ringing in their, in their mind or their spirit that you are crossing the line. Because for them, they have moved the line to intercourse. This means every other thing outside intercourse is, is okay. You know, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a programming in your mind that you need to, you need to adjust. You, as a human being, you have capacity to program your mind, and that controls your life. That's why the Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence for, out of it are the issues of life. The moment you tell yourself that, oh, I'm celibate, I'm trying to avoid intercourse, then you drop your guard as regards every other thing. That's not what we are called to as Christians. Scripture already showed it. 
We're called to sanctification. We're called to sexual purity. We're called to avoid any uncleanness, any perverseness, any immorality. Okay? Seven differences between celibacy and um, sexual purity. Number one, celibacy is usually an act of your own will. It's an act of your own will. While sexual purity is in honor and in obedience to God's standard and God's word. Big difference. Most people that have, that's why people that do not know Christ also has been celibate. I, I, I counsel and talk to a lot of people that are not Christians and they say, oh, I'm being celibate. I'm being celibate. And I usually ask them, why are you being celibate? To be sure where they are, um, you know, because the why always determines how strong you are with your stand. And a lot of them say things like, oh, I'm just not ready, or I'm waiting for the right person, things like that. So basically, celibacy is more an act of your will, while sexual purity is in honor and in obedience to God's commandments and God's precepts and God's word. Very, 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 very important, all right? It, 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 it's about you. When a celibacy is about you, it's your standard, your decision. It's based on convenience. It's you. It's what you want. When it's sexual purity, it has nothing to do with you. It is in honor and in, in obedience to God. Big difference. The standard, the reason why you're doing what you're doing is different. You know, when it's celibacy, it's your standard. You set the standard. When it's sexual purity, it's God's standard. It's bigger than you. You are doing it in honor and in obedience all right, to God's word. Very important. Number two, number two, difference between celibacy and sexual purity. When a celibacy is dependent on your own will, is dependent on your power, your own strength, your own commitment, your own dedication. That's what celibacy is. But for us as believers, we are trusting God to help us as we commit to that process. That's why in the scripture we read, he said he has given us his Holy Spirit. Very important. First Thessalonians 4 that we read. So we as believers, we are not trying to live a holy life by our power. He said without him, we can do nothing. That's what the Bible says. Without him, we can do nothing. He said he is the one at work in us, both to will and to do of his own good pleasure. So a real child of God, living a, a whole sexually pure life, he knows that every day he needs God's grace. Every day he needs God's power. He's never depending on his own determination, never de uh, depending on his own strength, always trusting the Spirit of God on a daily basis. But for celibacy, it's the pledge of man to man. It's self-will, self-plan. I, I promise not to. I will not to. And a lot of us have seen people that have told us, oh, I'm celibate. And then after a while, you know, they either get pregnant or something. Because they're trying to do it in their strength. We as Christians, we, we don't trust in our own strength. We are depending on the Holy Spirit. Big difference. All right? That's number two. Number three, celibacy, a lot of times, is a burden and a weight. It's a burden and a weight. It's, a, it's stress. It's stress. In fact, when you see Christians that are even trying to use their energy to be celibate, they are the ones that are very judgmental to other Christians because they are suffering so much, it pains them when they see another person escaping with what they are suffering from. They say, how dare you? How dare? They want to kill other Christians that make mistakes because they are suffering. They are not even happy. It's a, it's a burden. It's like a punishment given to them by God because God is so weak and doesn't want them to enjoy. No, no, that is God that created sex. God, 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 God is okay with sex. However, he knows that having it at the wrong time with the wrong person can be destructive. So for, for believers, sexual purity is worship, not a weight. Difference. Celibacy is a weight and a burden. For a Christian, sexual purity is worship before the Lord. We are doing it in reference. We are not angry that we are not messing up like our friends. We are not angry that all our mates are having fun and we are, and we are roasting and jonesing and slacking. That's not it. We are happy to present our bodies. Romans 12. He said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your most reasonable worship or service. For us, it's a form of worship. 
We are worshiping the Lord with our body because we are living sacrifices. Big difference. In celibacy, if you are angry. You are saying, oh God, why? This is, so, this is taking too long. Why? You are angry, you are grumbling. But when it comes to sexual purity, you understand the disposition is different. You are, you are, not, you are not angry. Nobody is forcing you. You, are, you, you. you have grown to the point where you love the Lord so much that you want to honor him with your body. You understand. When I read the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you will see it there. That we are doing it with joy, knowing that we are one body, we are one spirit with God. We are not being forced. We are not being bullied or beaten. We are, we are, we are, we are happy to live for God. Is worship. Big difference. Big difference. We are not looking for what to get away with. <laughs> I'll get to that. So number four, difference between celibacy and sexual purity is that celibacy focuses on the unmarried but sexual purity focuses on everybody. Celibacy focuses on the marriage. So most times when you hear the word celibate, I mean celibate, it's single people saying it. It's single people saying it. I'm not, I, I'm not, I can't remember hearing a married person saying I'm seeing celibate. No, he can't. So, but when is sexual purity, it involves everybody. It involves everybody. Because everybody needs to keep their spirit, soul, and body clean. So whether you're a young child, whether you're an old man, whether you are, you know, um, married, single, separated, you divorced, whatever it is, all of us are called into sexual purity. Every believer, every Christian is expected to live a life of sexual purity. But celibacy is, oh, I'm just, I'm just single. All right? Number five. Let's get into it a bit more. When is celibacy, he's talking about only physical intercourse. When is sexual purity is covering your whole spirit, soul, and body? I've mentioned this a bit at the beginning, but I'll go into it a bit deeper now. When it is celibacy, it's focused on intercourse. I'm abstaining from intercourse. Meanwhile, the person is enjoying outer course. When it is sexual purity, the person is keeping their spirit, their mind, and their body pure to God's standard. So what do we mean by this? You see, most people that focus on celibacy are saying, oh, you know, I can smoosh, I can kiss, you know, we can even send nudes, we can send sexual content, we can watch pornography, but I'm not going to, I promise myself, I'm not going to sleep with anybody. In fact, there's some virgins that are more sexually active than some non-virgins. There are some virgins that are way more sexually active than non-virgins. You see, in the standard of God, God even wants your mind to be kept holy. He wants your spirit to be kept holy. That's why Jesus said in Matthew that you've been told before that whoever sleeps with a woman has committed adultery. He said, but now I tell you that whoever looks at a woman lustfully has already slept with her. You see the difference now? In sexual purity, God even wants your mind to be kept clean. That's the big difference. He wants your mind to be kept clean. He doesn't even want you to be having unclean thoughts unholy thoughts, unwholesome thoughts. He wants your mind and your spirit to be clear. So you, 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 you can't be watching pornography and say you are being celibate. No, 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 no. I mean, or say you are being sexually pure. No. Because for us as believers, any form of perverseness, pornography is perverseness. Any form of uncleanliness, any form of immorality, it's, 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 it's sin. It's sin. So God wants, we have, called, we have been called to sexual purity. So when it is sexual purity, it's not only when you do intercourse. Having um, um, sexting, or um, I've forgotten this word now that people used to have sex on video. Uh, you know, um, all those things, you know, uh, video sex and um, phone sex and, you know, all these things and pornography, um, using sex toys, masturbation. Um, kissing someone or um, um, fondling with someone that you are not married to. And um, impurity and, and sexual uncleanness involves two people or one person. Basically, as long as it's outside marriage, any sexual activity outside of the union of marriage is unholy. So for you to say, oh, we're planning to get married soon so we can kiss. 
Oh, then you don't understand sexual purity. I actually watched um, someone answer a question like that. You know, and people were, and I read the comment section, I was heartbroken. I was like, so Christians are not even studying the Bible. It seems nobody's teaching the Bible anymore. Because somebody asked the question, in it, and I, again, I don't even know why Christians are asking this question. I went to, I can never forget, I went to preach in one, one campus many years ago, and 99% of the questions after I preached on relationship that were asked that day was, oh, can I kiss? Can I smoosh? Can I fondle? Can we do this? That was all. These were students. I was saying, so are you guys doing any other thing? Other than thinking about sex. If, you're on, if you like sex so much, Paul was clear about it, it's better to marry than to burn. If you like sex so much, go and marry. You'll find that you won't be that interested in sex. Because this, this one is carnality. It's, it's, it's devilish. It's not godly. So they asked this girl. I watched this um, show, um, video. They asked this girl, um, is it okay for two Christians to kiss? And she was like, yeah, the Bible never said in anywhere that you cannot kiss. You know, just make sure the kiss doesn't lead to sin. And people were clapping and they wrote, they, 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 the comments were showing that people were happy with the answer. I mean, that answer can't be, it can, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's in, it can't be more wrong. Very wrong understanding of scripture. So the, two people that are not married can kiss. So I always ask the question, can a married person kiss someone they are not married to. I always ask people that. And they say, oh, no. I say, why? They say, because they are not married. I said, so these two single people, are they married? Same rule applies. If a married person cannot kiss an unmarried person, two unmarried, the reason why you can't kiss that person because they're not married, that's the same reason why two unmarried people cannot kiss. Kissing is part of sex. You see, so that's the first problem. Many people think intercourse is sex. Of course not. Intercourse alone is not sex. Intercourse is a part of sex. Every normal human being, it's only in rape that people have intercourse alone and straight. Every other normal sexual activity involves petting, involves kissing, sometimes involves looking at each other's eyes, sometimes involves talking sexy. That's how a normal human being has sex. So every part of it is it. It's like saying you have uh, the, 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 the side view mirror of your car. It's a part of your car. It's a part of your car. So can I steal your side view mirror and say it's not your car? No, it's your car. So kissing is a part of sex. This is why two single people cannot be kissing and smooshing in church. I can kiss my wife in church. I've kissed my wife in church. When we do uh, marriage programs and we ask, um, we, we, in fact, on a wedding day, you are demanded to kiss your wife in church, to show you it's holy. But how many single people can come on during the service and say, one, I just want to kiss my girlfriend? The beating, if it's an African church, <laughs> they will beat you, and when you get on your parents, we we'll finish the job. <laughs> one of you will not come back alive to that service, I'm sure. But you see, it's, it's unholy, that's why you can't do it in church. I can kiss my wife in church. I dare any single person claiming that is right. Go to the front of the congregation on Sunday, kiss your girlfriend, if it's holy. It's unclean, that's why you can't do it. It's unholy. That's why you can't do it. I can kiss my wife. That's the difference. You see? So two unmarried people, even if they're planning to marry next week, even if they're planning to marry next, next day, even if they're planning to marry next hour, it's unholy for them to kiss. You know why? Because there have been weddings that have been canceled on the altar. There have been weddings that have been canceled the day to it. Kissing someone you're not married to means you are tentatively kissing somebody's husband or wife. You are taking what you have not paid for. You are taking what's not yours. That relationship might never lead to marriage. There are many of them like that in church. So if you have dated five, six people, you have kissed five, six people, other people's husbands and other people's wives. The only sexual activity honored by God is the one done inside of marriage. Anything outside that, you're kissing. Kissing? I always ask people, what's the purpose of kissing, first of all? What's the purpose of kissing, first of all? Kissing is to get you aroused. Kissing is in itself doesn't satisfy. So you, you don't light a, a, a stove or a cooker and say, oh, what are you doing? Say, oh, I'm just testing if my cooker works. And you just make it hot, put on the gas, it's hot. Are you cooking anything? Say, no, we're not cooking. We're just testing it. You look like an insane person. The purpose of kissing is to get us aroused and prepared for sex. It's a part of the sexual act. This is why you cannot kiss someone you're not married to, whether you're married or not, to another person. Kissing should only happen. And, and in most cases, when two single people are kissing, so are their hands behind their back 
or are they holding each other? We don't have stay in the, in the neck or on the head forever. No, it will start to move to other sexual parts. So from there, smooching will start. From there, fondling will start. That's unholy. See, your body, I think we should get talk about that. Your body is actually the temple of God. Do you understand? Your body is not even your own. So that's the mindset of sexual purity. It's for you to understand that you do not own yourself. Tesla says you must possess your body in sanctification. You do not own yourself. So your body is it. Let, let, let's, let's read one scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 from verse 13. It says, meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. It says, now the body is not for fornication. See it there. Again. The body is not for any form of sexual uncleanness, perverseness, perverseness and, 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 and immorality. It says, um, but for the Lord. Do you see this? The body is for the Lord and the Lord for the body. He said, and God had both raised up the Lord and will also raise, up, up, raise us up by his own power. He said, know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ. Do you see what they're saying? So they are calling you to a holy thinking about your body. It's not your body. You can't just kiss a friend. You can't just kiss someone because he's cute. You can't just kiss someone because you have a crush on him. You can't kiss someone because you hope to marry them. That's why marriage is called holy matrimony. There is, there, you, you have crossed a line when you get married. It is, it is a thing. You can't, you can't be involved and indulge in any sexual activity before marriage. It's just unholy. That's it. You have to cross to the other side. Let's continue. And somebody's thinking about how am I going to be sure of sexual experience? Fine, I'll get to answer that. Because I already know how you think, you young guys. I know you. It says, know ye not that your bodies are uh, members of Christ, I shall take, and he said, um, um, shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot? He said, God forbid. He said, what, what? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For the two said he shall be one flesh. So basically, part of what sex is designed for is to cement or join two people together. So science has agreed with this, but scripture has always said this. That sex is how two people start a union. Science has also confirmed that when two people are involved in sexual activity, there are hormones and chemicals that are flowing in them, oxytocin and the rest, that creates a bond between the two of them. This is why a lot of people still go back to their exes or even while they are married, fantasize about their ex or contact their ex or cheat with their ex because that bond is still strong and is there. God created that sexual act to bond two people together. Sex is like, is like glue for two married people. So when you are kissing or smooshing or having sexual intercourse, somebody you're not married to yet, you are, pre -married, you are pre prematurely joining to somebody that you are not yet married to. And sometimes some of those things only to marry. And sometimes you are creating a foundation. Look at my video where I taught on what nobody tells you about sex. It's on, it's on this same YouTube channel. You are creating a foundation that we don't honor the rules of God in this house. That's what you're saying. When two people that are not married say, we can't wait, we can't wait. Let's start stealing what's not ours. Let's start taking what we've not paid for. Let's start taking it before the time. What both of you have done, you've laid a foundation of indiscipline. You've laid a foundation of um, lack of respect for each other and lack of respect for God. That same attitude and behavior will follow you into marriage. Because you've both said, we don't have boundaries in our minds. So when you get married, you see that these people will struggle with staying faithful to their spouse because there's no, there are no walls. The wall keeping you from touching yourselves when you are single is the same wall that will keep you from touching other people when you are married to each other. But you see, many young people threw away those walls. Then they're surprised why they're not committed and faithful in their marriages because a fornicator is just an adulterer in training. That's it. Same thing. Let me finish. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. All right? See verse 18. It says, flee fornication. Run away from it. Every sin that a man does without the body and all that. And, and go to verse 19. It says, um, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? So it's not your body. You don't have a right to do whatever you like with it. Your body, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you, have, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. It said, for you are bought with a price. Say, so therefore, glorify God in your body 
and in your spirit, which are God. So I told you from the beginning, sexual purity is never about just the body. They are interested in your mind. Are you consuming pornography? Then that is unholy. It's, it's, it's part of what fornication entails. Are you, are you sexting? Are you having heavily, you know, um, um, sexual talk with somebody you're not married with? It's part of it. So, you see, um, sexual purity covers masturbation, covers lust, covers evil thoughts, lustful thoughts. You know, it's, it's a wider range of stuff. You know, wider range of stuff. Covers flirting, not necessarily flirting. You know, so it's, it's not just intercourse, but celibacy focuses on intercourse, but sexual um, purity focuses on intercourse, outer course, uh, spirit course, mind course, all your course. Are you getting what I'm saying? Very, very important. Number six, celibacy is usually time bound. Meanwhile, sexual purity is for life. So most people that say they are celibate, you'll find out. When you ask them, what's your plan? They'll say, well, I'm being celibate till I'm 30. I'm being celibate till I meet the right person. I'm being celibate till I start a relationship. You know, the celibacy usually has a time, you know, frame. Sexual purity, on the other hand, is for life. When you are single, you work on it. When you are married, they, I mean, in a relationship, on courtship or dating, you work on it. When you are married, you continue working on sexual purity. When you are a, grand, a father, you continue sexual purity. When you are a grandfather, you continue sexual purity. It's a lifelong thing. It's a life God has called us into. It's not a one-off thing. It's not for a season. It's not for a time. But usually, people that talk about celibacy are focusing on a time frame. I don't want to just fornicate. I don't want to have sex for marriage. And they think that's where it's going to end. They think that when you get married, you will not be sexual. You will not be tempted anymore. Marriage does not stop sexual temptation. Marriage does not. In fact, there are many couples that there's a heavy pornography in their marriages. There's, they are dealing with serious issues with sex toys, serious issues with all kinds of things, you know, with, 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 with all kinds of things. Sexual purity is not time bound. It's for the rest of your life. This is why you can't, you can't be focusing on what to get away with. And that's what a lot of, a lot of people do. That's what a lot of Christians try to do. They say, what can I get? Can I kiss? If it's kiss on the cheek, if it's kiss. You know, you're asking the wrong questions. If your mind is already planning or thinking something, you already missed it. Sexual purity is spirit, soul, and body. So even your thoughts, God wants your thoughts, your motives, your intents. That's why the Bible said the word of God. I'll get to that. How you, do, how you actually build sexual purity is from the word of God and from prayer. We'll get to that because it, it checks the intent of the heart. Why do you want to go and visit at that time when there's nobody at home? Why do you want to have this video call? Why do you want to do these things you want to do? The intent of the heart matters. Why do you want to kiss? Because you can't hold yourself, you see. The intent of the heart matters with sexual purity. So celibacy is usually time bound. But celibacy is for life, all right? And lastly, lastly, number seven, celibacy usually goes with an undisciplined or indisciplined mind, while sexual purity usually is bettered and is sustained through a disciplined mind. You see, the celibate person usually does not talk about the other areas of their life generally. But for a child of God, God doesn't want us to be holy only sexually. God is trying to deal with us holistically. So it covers your morals. It covers um, your, your, your thinking towards money. It covers your, your, your thinking towards lying, towards honesty. You know, towards a lot of other things. It's not just sex. The celibate person is talking just about sex. But when it comes to purity, you'll find out that it's not in isolation. You can't, the way Christianity works... You can't say, oh, I promise not to lie, but I'm going to do even that bad thing. No. God wants to work on you holistically. So it's a, it's a whole uh, um, 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 system. He's dealing with you in terms of talking too much, eating too much, lying, stealing. Everything is part of it because they are all related to your sexual purity. Eventually, they are all related. How you deal with money, gluttony, how you eat, everything. They're all related. So when a celibacy, you find out just about sex. 
But when it's sexual purity, it's not just sexual purity, actually. It's total purity. So you hear sanctification. God wants your whole life to be brought under the supervision, the rule of his spirit and his word. So one is based on convenience. The other one is based on conviction. There's a deeper root under sexual purity beyond just sex. We are called to a life of pleasing God. Whether it's financially, food we eat, friends we have, places we go. All right? So I hope with these few words, I've been able to help you understand the difference between celibacy and uh, sexual purity. In the last five minutes, what are the things that can help us live a sexually pure life? Number one, by studying the word. You cannot live a sexually pure life without reading the Bible. It's not, it's not by determination. You need, to, you need to feed your spirit. You need to feed your spirit. So Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, even to the piercing and sunder of the soul and the spirit, and it checks the intent of your heart. That's because that's where the immorality is born from. Most times, you already know when you are going to do something you shouldn't do. You're already chatting with someone, talking with someone, thinking certain things. So the word of God goes to affect even your intent, your purpose. The reason why you want to go to that place. The reason why you are wearing this kind of dress to church or to wherever you're going. Or even have, this is why you own this dress at all. The reason why you've not burnt this dress or thrown it away. Because it's too tight. It's showing parts of you you should not show. You should not flaunt to the public. So it goes down there, all right? So the word of God. Number two is a life of prayer. You live a life of personal devotion. Nowadays, in, 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 in most of Christendom, especially in my part of the world, uh, people don't value personal altar anymore. You know, everything is about miracle praying. You need to have a personal place. See, God can't change you in some of those public prayer meetings. You need to have a personal place of fellowship with the Lord. That's where he speaks. There are certain things about your life you can never hear in public. That's just the truth in a public prayer meeting. You have to have a personal altar. When we were young, people were trained to focus on a personal altar. Today, people are focused to focus on the, there are two or three or four altars that everybody wants to go and fellowship. It's, it's, it's not scriptural. Everybody needs a personal place because there are things about your life can, that can't be discussed in a public meeting. It, it's you and God. It's you and God. He will point out some things about your life. He will flash his light on some certain behavior. He will also give you the strength of the spirit to deal with those things. All right? So you must have a personal place of prayer. All right? Then number three, the association you keep. Who are the people you are working with? This is so powerful. If all your friends are always talking about sex, thinking about sex, saying they can't wait to have sex, if that's all you guys discuss or, or wholesome talk all the time, they are thinning and wearing you out spiritually. So the friends, then lastly, the things you are consuming. What are you consuming? I counseled somebody one time. She said, she said Pastor, the lady she said, Pastor, I am dealing with masturbation. Serious problem. I said, great. I said, um, how does this start? She says, when I'm reading um, you know, these novels that are heavy in sexual content. Some of you might be movies you are watching you know, that are heavy in sexual I said, um, are you, have you stopped watching those, uh, reading those novels? She said, no. She still reads them. I said, then the, the habits cannot stop. The issue cannot stop. You have to watch what they're consuming. Bible said, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. So what are you consuming? What are you consuming? Uh, the kind of channels you follow, the kind of things you watch will affect you. So these few things will help you. Um, um, go to my Q&A channel. I'll, I'll answer some questions relating to what I just taught in the Q&A channel. I'll see you there. So God bless you.